Hello students, uh, this is Professor McDermott. Well, we're up to lecture 10. Uh, the topic is the 1920s, which uh, have become known as the Roaring Twenties, partly because um, America was very prosperous during this time. It was a period of great business expansion. Uh, it was a period when uh, individuals' lifestyles changed um, dramatically with new technology, new fashions, um, new art, uh, new innovations in culture and in music. Um, so a very exciting time uh, for Americans, the Roaring Twenties. Well, in spite of Woodrow Wilson's appeal to the voters to vote Democratic uh, in 1920, uh, the election of 1920 was a landslide with Republican Warren G. Harding of Ohio uh, winning 60% of the presidential vote. Um, socialist candidate Eugene Debs ran again uh, and managed to win 3.4% of the vote even though he was running from jail uh, where he had been tossed by uh, Woodrow Wilson. Um, in a very magnanimous gesture, uh, Harding uh, pardoned Debs and released him from jail, and then uh, spent the rest of his administration basically trying to promote uh, big business. Uh, that was his main priority as president. However, um, Harding was uh, an incompetent president in many ways, uh, and he chose the wrong people uh, to serve him in the government. Many of them were corrupt, and uh, there was really one scandal after another during the Harding administration. So Harding actually died in office, uh, a broken man, in 1923, which meant that his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, uh, succeeded him as president and was then elected uh, in his own right in the year 1924. Uh, Coolidge was famously a very quiet man who hardly ever said anything and so people called him uh, Silent Cal. Um, when he died in 1933 the humorist Dorothy Parker asked how could they tell? <laughs> Uh, because his personality was so flat. Um, Coolidge also uh, was very pro-business and basically con uh, continued um, the pro-business policies of Harding. Uh, one of his uh, famous sayings, um, as always short and sweet, uh, Coolidge said at one point, quote, the chief business of America is business. Um, and that attitude very much epitomizes the 1920s. Uh, not um, democracy, not promoting American values throughout the world, uh, as, as Wilson would have had it, had it, but the chief business of America is business. Um, and in order to promote business, um, Coolidge's Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon uh, presided over a, a, a great reduction in income taxes and also corporate taxes. Uh, meanwhile, Herbert Hoover was running the Commerce uh, Department and promoting business expansion from there. Now, why did Americans um, turn to making money um, and abandoning the high ideals of the Wilson administration? Well, um, it took a while, but the calamity of World War I finally did sink in on both sides um, of the Atlantic. And uh, in America and in Europe, especially artists, focused on the meaningless destruction of the war, which they now saw as having been um, to no real purpose, especially since the U.S. had failed to join the League of Nations. So you have writers like Ford Maddox Ford, um, e. e. Cummings, and especially Ernest Hemingway, uh, who emerges as a very important novelist who's writing novels about the Great War um, that are very cynical, uh, extremely, extremely negative. Um, it was Hemingway's friend, um, Gertrude Stein, who uh, said to him on one occasion, quote, you are all a lost generation end quote, uh, meaning that uh, especially in Europe, an entire generation of young men had been wiped out 
um, by the war, and, and, and those who had survived, like Hemingway, uh, who had been an ambulance driver during the war, were um, aimless, rootless, um, disillusioned, and in um, despair. And so Hemingway chose this line to be the um, epigraph of his great 1926 novel, uh, The Sun Also Rises. There was a lot of disillusionment with democracy as well, especially in Europe. Some Europeans came to the conclusion that democracy hadn't really done anything to prevent uh, World War I, and perhaps democracy was a failed experiment, which um, led some European countries, like, uh, of course, Italy and Germany later, to experiment with new types of government, uh, totalitarian fascist dictatorships. Um, in the U.S., um, artists, writers, cultural leaders didn't really go quite that far. Uh, the typical response was simply to turn away from politics entirely and um, to focus on issues of cultural change, um, the dramatic, very rapid changes that were taking place in society, and uh, the failure of many people to to keep up with the changes. Um, there was a sense that uh, new technology was moving so fast that it was impossible for human beings to absorb um, all of the new developments. And uh, this, this phenomenon was called cultural lag. I think we still very much experience this nowadays in the uh, computer age, but uh, people first became aware of it in um, the 1920s. And so uh, the typical poem or novel of the period would show people who in a sense are, are, are lost, are broken, are, are, are defeated, unable to cope with the total uprooting of their old cultural beliefs and, and habits um, and lifestyles. Um, one, peer, uh, one place where you see a lot of change is in terms of uh, religious beliefs. Um, the Great War had led to a lot of disillusionment um, from people who formerly were re religious believers, but the massive destruction of that war um, you know, led people to wonder whether God really was in control of the universe. And some people turned instead to new uh, trends in thinking like the psychology of Sigmund Freud, um, which really didn't fit very well with any kind of um, traditional religious viewpoint. Uh, Freud believed that human beings were essentially driven by sex, that every person had uh, what he called the libido, which was driving them forward to, um, uh, to be uh, more and more sexually active, and that all of the rules and restrictions that had been imposed in um, traditional society were very fragile and subject to being swept away at any moment by human uh, passions, as happened in a sense in the Great War, uh, not through the passion of sex, but through the passion for violence. Um, that, in other words, there was a kind of thin veneer of Western civilization, but it was very fragile and uh, in the process of collapsing, and that the uh, human sex drive uh, was in fact emerging to replace that. And so you see uh, the decline uh, to some extent in church going and traditional morality during this period and an adherence to organized uh, religion. Um, one very important American writer who seemed to capture the moment uh, in, for many people in his very difficult but powerful poetry was uh, T.S. Eliot, who was born in St. Louis, later on moved to um, England and became a British citizen, um, and eventually joined the Church of England. So Eliot, in a sense, doesn't fit this picture because he did embrace Christianity, but his uh, early works portray, um, in a sense, the failure of uh, the modern world and the emptiness of modern life. And, and none does that better than his uh, lengthy 1922 poem called 
uh, the wasteland. And I want to read you a little excerpt of that so you can get a sense of uh, the kind of mood that was evoked in a lot of poetry during this period. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats, and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. So what can we say about this, uh, uh, this poem? In a way, he's depicting the modern landscape as if humanity were now abandoned in a desert, um, having lost all of its traditional beliefs. Uh, they've become only a heap of broken images or rubbish. Um, and so where can anyone find shelter um, in this modern world? And, and, and this little excerpt ends with um, Eliot invoking fear, saying, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. It's, it's as if humanity has returned um, through the violence of the Great War um, to the dust that it came from and uh, has no solace, no comfort, no place to turn. However, other artists um, of the period, especially in film, uh, which was fantastically popular in the 1920s, uh, took a very different approach, um, a more humorous approach, or even positively embracing the changes that were taking place um, in the world at this time. Um, for the humorous approach, we need only look at the great uh, silent films of uh, Charlie Chaplin. Um, and at this point, I need to explain that um, you uh, will need to look at the folder that's called Supplemental Videos um, to see the videos that I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, fortunately, uh, one of the nice features of D2L is that you can actually have two windows um, open at the same time uh, on either side of your screen, and so you can move back and forth between this lecture and um, these supplemental videos. Um, and I'm sorry this is a little awkward, but uh, this is just about the only way we can do this. Um, so first, uh, in the supplemental videos folder, there's a link to uh, a, a short excerpt from Charlie Chaplin's uh, film Modern Times uh, from 1936. So right now, if you would just pause this lecture, uh, open another window, and uh, open up that uh, video, it's about five minutes take a look at it and then um, come back and we'll talk about it. Welcome back! Uh, <laughs> I trust you've watched the Chaplin video uh, by now and I, I hope you liked it. It's uh, I think still incredibly uh, funny <clears throat> 80 years later. So you, you get the sense of uh, technology that's changing so rapidly that human beings really can't keep up. On the other hand, Chaplin does find humor uh, in that. Uh, another one of the supplemental videos is uh, actually kind of a, a montage of uh, sections from a film that came out in 1927 called It, starring um, Clara Bow, one of the biggest silent movie stars of the time. And forever after uh, this film came out, she was known as the It Girl. And as you watch this, uh, uh, this little uh, compilation of images from It, I want you to ask yourself the question, what is It? What was it that Clara Bow had um, that seemed to set her apart and give her this quality of It? Um, so if you would go over and watch uh, It, and then um, come back and we'll proceed with the lecture. All right, what is it? Um, 
Well, um, in a sense, it, it could be a lot of things, and uh, this is where I really wish we were in a classroom, uh, so that I could hear all of your ideas and insights about this uh, question. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we're not. So I uh, just need to summarize a few things that you may have thought of for yourself. Um, part of it had to do with the increased independence of the modern woman. Obviously, in this, in these excerpts, Clara Bow has a job. Um, she's working for a corporation, although she does seem to spend most of her time making eyes uh, at her boss. She is a working woman, and that means that uh, she has some freedom. She has some disposable income uh, so that she can dress in the latest fashions um, and increase her sex appeal, which clearly is also part of it. Um, but also, I think you see this uh, fun-loving attitude that the Clara Bow character has in this film, and that was very important, too. Not everybody was stuck in a mire of depression after World War I, like T.S. Eliot. Some people, having suffered through the war and the deprivation it brought, uh, in the 1920s just wanted to uh, have fun um, and forget all that suffering and sacrifice. And so I think um, Clara Bow's um, itness uh, has to do with her desire to just have a good time and uh, explore life, be free. Um, and uh, adopt the new lifestyle that many women were experimenting with in um, the 1920s. In fact, women were among the most enthusiastic uh, people in embracing um, the changes of the 1920s, uh, including new technology um, that you could use in the home to ma if you were a housewife to make your work easier and your life simpler. Uh, but also, um, quite a few women uh, remain in the workforce after World War I, maybe not with jobs like uh, uh, putting ships together or anything like that, but uh, women uh, increasingly move, uh, especially into clerical jobs, working for these expanding large um, corporations. So uh, more and more women are working outside the home uh, than had done so before, uh, World War One, um, and again, these women now have income. Uh, they're usually living on their own if they're single women away from their families, as they would have done previously, and so they're not being supervised, and they feel much freer to adopt um, a, a more radical lifestyle compared to what had gone before for women. Uh, for example, women in the 1920s, for the first time, begin to smoke in public, um, they begin to drink. They, uh, obviously, prohibition is in effect here, but they could, there were many uh, undercover bars that were called speakeasies during the period, and so um, women and men begin to flock together to these um, secret illegal clubs, um, which wasn't the case before World War I. The old taverns and saloons were uh, totally frequented by men, and uh, women uh, essentially were not allowed um, to go there. Um, also, women began to use cosmetics, which doesn't seem that radical, but really before um, the 1920s, if you were a woman and you smoke and you drank in public and you used makeup, um, that was a sign that you were a prostitute, and uh, <laughs> it was really uh, stigmatized, though, uh, that kind of behavior. Uh, and so uh, these 1920s new women um, really begin uh, to expand their repertoire of acceptable behavior, um, and also begin to adopt um, freer um, fashions in terms of clothing, and you see some examples in the picture on the left here of women who are uh, wearing the clothing associated with what we call flappers, okay? Um, a flapper uh, was a woman who was likely to smoke, drink, use makeup, uh, also to wear shorter skirts, as you can see here, uh, to wear short hair. Uh, this is part of the flapper fashion. Uh, to wear pantyhose instead of uh, old-fashioned, say, wool socks that, that women would have worn before. 
Um, also part of this flapper look was the desire to become very skinny. Um, the ideal of beauty for a woman during this period was to be uh, very thin and also flat chested. This was one period where it was considered beautiful um, to be flat chested, essentially to, uh, in a way, to look like a teenage boy. Um, and so this was the goal for um, flappers, and actually the smoking, in a way, went hand in hand with that. If you look at the ad on the right here, you see this ad is promising that if you smoke, like you strike um, cigarettes, you won't have as many cravings for sweets. Um, and uh, you won't be as fat. And notice the short hairdo on this uh, actress, Constance, Constance Talmadge, who's selling these uh, cigarettes. Um, there were also uh, a lot of crazes uh, during the 1920s in terms of music um, and dance. Uh, of course, jazz music is becoming very popular, and one very popular dance um, that uh, was invented during the 1920s was called the Charleston. Um, actually, I shouldn't say it was invented in the 1920s. This was These moves, these dance moves, were actually older um, dance traditions coming out of African-American um, culture. And there were a lot of ways in which 1920s music and dance um, and culture in general were influenced by uh, African-American cultural um, traditions. One of the biggest stars of the 1920s was Josephine Baker. Um, Baker was uh, an, an American who moved to Paris, France, and became an international sensation, just a huge star in uh, Paris doing what was called the banana dance. <laughs> and uh, very scantily clad, as you can see there. And so this caused a sensation. Um, other huge stars of the period, uh, Bessie Smith, a uh, great uh, blues singer, and of course, uh, jazz great uh, Louis Armstrong, depicted at the bottom of this um, slide. Armstrong was a, a, a trumpeter uh, a band leader and uh, a huge star at the jazz age, jazz age, which was fueled by radio. Uh, radio had recently been um, invented and during the 1920s uh, was becoming widespread throughout the country. And uh, during this period of the jazz age, about three quarters of the programs on uh, radio stations consisted of jazz. Uh, and of course, jazz also had its origins in African-American music. Um, so there are a couple of supplemental videos here. There is a video of Josephine Baker um, doing her banana dance, and uh, also of Louis Armstrong and his band doing a number called uh, The Tiger Rag. So if you would go and watch both of those videos and then come back, I'll see, uh, see you in a moment. All right, um, so um, you see how these African-American artists are in a way drawing on um, the public image of Africa uh, as part of their artistry. Uh, Josephine Baker's banana dance, clearly the, uh, there's an African motif there. And also the tiger rag when Louis Armstrong sings about uh, running through the jungle uh, with the tiger and, um, and so forth. Um, and so perhaps drawing on stereotypes rather than realities, but still, um, you see how, uh, African-ness is becoming a very important, uh, factor in culture during, uh, this period. Also in literature, African-Americans enjoy uh, a renaissance, what's been called the Harlem Renaissance, because um, many African-American writers and artists lived in the uh, neighborhood of Harlem um, in Manhattan Island in New York City. Uh, so in a way that becomes the headquarters of uh, a movement um, of people uh, that has become known as the New Negro Movement. 
that uh, in a sense African Americans emerging um, from the shadows and becoming much more uh, leaders in terms of culture in the United States. Uh, among the writers uh, of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, Langston Hughes, the poet, Zora Neale Hurston, who was an anthropologist but also a, a novelist, um, Gene Toomer, uh, James Weld, and Johnson, I could go on and on. Um, now, some of these artists <laughs> really rejected uh, the kind of stereotypes that were portrayed, for instance, in the Banana Dance and uh, thought that it was necessary for African Americans to adopt more of uh, high culture and to avoid um, jazz and, and, and some of the things that they looked down on. But other members of the Harlem Renaissance uh, really embraced jazz, uh, such as Langston Hughes, who wrote lyrics for um, jazz songs. Uh, one very important movement for African Americans during the 1920s was uh, led by a man named Marcus Garvey who found an organization called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Essentially, essentially what Garvey did was to resurrect the ideas of uh, Bishop Turner in the 19th century. You may recall that uh, Bishop James McNeil Turner wanted African Americans to leave the United States and move back to Africa to get away from Jim Crow and segregation. And uh, this was Garvey's idea as well, essentially to separate from white people, white culture, go back to Africa um, and, um, and live their own separate life. But as before, most African Americans rejected uh, this idea and the majority of African American leaders were committed to staying in the United States and trying to improve um, American society by uplifting the black race. Um, one of those, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, who continues to be very prominent um, during this period. It's interesting, um, Du Bois, uh, by this point in time, really focused on what he called the Talented Tenth, of African Americans. Du Bois believed that uh, about 10% of blacks in this country were um, more advanced, in a sense superior in intelligence, um, to the other 90%. And so Du Bois actually wanted that 10% uh, to have more babies. <laughs> And he wanted the other 90% to have fewer babies and, and to improve the African-American gene pool as he saw it. This way of thinking is part of a broader movement that's called eugenics um, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward. African-Americans also, of course, faced many dangers um, during the 1920s, even as their culture began to flourish uh, and grow. Um, and one of the dangers was the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, which was refounded actually in Georgia at uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia in 1915. And it's quite interesting that um, this second Klan was inspired by a film, the film Birth of a Nation, that uh, we're watching during this module in um, discussing. Uh, and so this is another reason why I wanted to assign this film to you, um, because out of all the films ever produced in Hollywood, um, I believe that The Birth of a Nation probably had more actual impact on people's lives than any other, because it led to the, the uh, renewal of the KKK. And this clan um, really became a huge mass movement around the country. By 1924, they claimed to have 5 million members throughout the United uh, States. And not only that, but this Klan was not confined to the South. It was very popular throughout the entire nation, showing once again that, that racism was not merely a um, Southern phenomenon. But it's interesting about this version of the KKK, um, they not only hated blacks, but they also had other targets. Um, 
for example, Catholics. Uh, so they would sometimes burn crosses in front of Catholic churches. Um, Jews. Uh, so religious minorities also immigrants so essentially the clan uh, takes up the standard of the old nativism and uh, retools it for um, the modern world also political dissidents socialists communists also uh, fell afoul of this new kkk and became targets for their violence um, this clan uh, peaked in 1924 about 1926, it began to decline because of uh, some corruption and scandals in the leadership. Um, but especially, I think, after the Great Depression begins in, the 19, in 1929, um, uh, the Klan really begins to decline because people are focused simply on surviving um, and they have less time to terrorize uh, their unfortunate neighbors. There were other ways, um, besides clan activity, that hostility to immigrants really comes out strongly uh, during the 1920s. Uh, so in 1921, Congress passed a law which essentially set quotas for each nation in the world as to how many immigrants could come from each particular country. And the quota in 1921 was 3% of the people from that nation that were living in America in 1910 were allowed to emigrate in any given year. Uh, by 1924, um, Congress had decided to make this even stricter, and so they lowered the quota to only 2% of the number of people that had been here from each country in 1890. Um, so the main target of these laws, uh, once again, are immigrants from Eastern Europe, from Southern Europe, uh, Jews, Catholics, people that were uh, suspected of being socialists, communists, anarchists. Um, these laws are, are really meant to decrease immigration uh, from those areas. Also, the Chinese and the Japanese continue to be excluded almost totally. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, really, the only country in the world um, that had no limit in terms of the number of immigrants they could bring, no quotas, was Mexico. And uh, that may surprise you because, of course, in this year's presidential election, immigration from Mexico um, has been a huge issue with candidates saying they want to restrict that even more. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, Mexicans were totally free to enter the country uh, really up until the 1960s. Um, why was that? Well, uh, there were already a lot of Hispanic Americans living in the Southwest, um, Texas, California, New Mexico, etc. Um, and also they were needed um, by business people for, um, for the fruit crop. Uh, they didn't seem as culturally alien, um, say, as the Chinese and Japanese. So uh, no limits on Mexican immigration yet. Well, uh, as before, part of the motive for this was the belief that the white race was um, superior, that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, wasps, as they're called especially, were superior um, to non-white people and also to non-Protestants, Catholic Jew Catholics, Jews, um, and so forth. Um, and it was widely believed that um, people from Italy, from Eastern Europe, from China, um, had a genetic predisposition to become uh, criminals and to do antisocial um, things. And so this way of thinking, too, was part of the eugenics movement. And um, scientists who believed in eugenics actually testified at the congressional hearings um, in support of restricting immigration from non-white, non-Protestant people. So what is eugenics? Um, well, basically, it was uh, linked to old social Darwinist ideas. Uh, the notion was that the white race was the superior race, um, and that you had to promote births among white people and also discourage them among non-white people. But within the white race, too, um, there was an attempt to uh, identify people who had good genes, 
uh, who were upstanding citizens and, and, and productive members of society and encouraged them to reproduce more while uh, poor whites, uh, people who were criminals, people who had some kind of disability or, or hereditary um, genetic defect were to be discouraged from uh, reproducing. Okay, So what you see here is a big change uh, in the way of thinking about poor people in America. We saw how the reformers of the Gilded Age um, really believed that the reason why some people embraced a life of crime was their environment, and that if you could only change the environment, like as people like Jane Addams wanted to do, um, you would help eliminate the problem of crime. But uh, eugenicists uh, are looking only at people's DNA, uh, their genes, okay? And so they think the only way to eliminate crime is to improve the gene pool and to get the more desirable individuals to reproduce more and the less desirable to reproduce less. Um, perhaps the most famous American eugenicist was Margaret Sanger, who is best known nowadays for being the founder of uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, Margaret Sanger uh, was a eugenicist. Part of the reason why she promoted the wider availability of contraceptives was um, in order to restrict births among groups of people that she saw as undesirable. And you see a cartoon from her journal, the Birth Control Review, from 1918 over to the right. Um, the goal was to eliminate what she called human waste. Um, now, uh, <laughs> I, I, to be fair, I should say that Planned Parenthood nowadays, nowadays disavows um, the uh, eugenic origins of the contraceptive movement and, and, and so forth, so they've distanced themselves uh, from that, but it, it's really quite true that Sanger was a uh, eugenicist. The eugenics movement was successful in the United States in uh, getting laws passed um, to restrict births by uh, sterilizing people against their will, especially people that were in mental hospitals. So a number of states um, passed legislation saying that um, if, you ha if you were um, in a mental hospital and you had undesirable traits, um, you could be sterilized against your will in order uh, so that you wouldn't reproduce and pass on those traits to any children. Um, and in fact, in three years alone, between 1921 and 1924, 2,689 um, Americans were sterilized without their consent. How would this work? Well, a doctor in a hospital would uh, go before a court and ask the judge for a court order um, so that he could carry out the sterilization uh, procedure. Uh, one person who was um, the victim of this procedure uh, lived in a mental hospital in Virginia. Her name was Carrie Bell, uh, and she was sterilized against her will um, in 1927, um, and then later got out of the mental hospital, got a lawyer, and uh, took her case to the United States Supreme Court. And interestingly, the Supreme Court ruled that these forced sterilization laws were constitutional, they were legal. <clears throat> so this was um, a, a prominent movement in American life. Um, but it declined because as World War II began, was obvious that Adolf Hitler, the Nazi dictator of Germany, shared many ideas with um, the eugenicists. And in fact, um, eugenicists in America and Great Britain had corresponded with eugenicists in Germany, um, contributing very much to the policies of the Nazi regime. So after Hitler was defeated and uh, uh, really disgraced in 1945, uh, eugenics also um, became um, very unpopular because of its association with Hitler, totally discredited, and so it really fades from the scene after World War II. Well, turning back to um, business for a moment, 
Um, the 1920s saw many advances in, um, in the business world. Uh, some of them were pioneered by a man named Frederick Winslow uh, Taylor, who was an efficiency expert, which meant that his job was to d d uh, d find ways to make factory production more efficient. And so Taylor would do studies with factory workers using cameras on the right, you see a time-lapse photograph which depicts the movements uh, of a certain worker as he does his job. And by studying these photographs, Taylor and his uh, employees would try to determine ways that workers could uh, become more efficient, not waste um, movements. So you see that Taylorism, um, in a way, makes working life more regimented, that you're only supposed now to work um, to move in a certain pattern um, so as to make more profits for the corporation that you're working for. Um, this approach to factory work was really um, invented though by Henry Ford. Um, already in 1914, uh, Ford had created the first assembly line uh, in his Michigan factory to mass produce the car called uh, the Model T, which was the first really popular and affordable uh, motor vehicle. And of course, Ford was drawing on uh, the Chicago Stockyard uh, sort of proto-assembly line as we saw earlier, but it was Ford who really um, perfected the assembly line to the point that by 1925, the Ford plant um, was producing a new uh, Model T every 10 um, seconds. So uh, the beginning of mass productions uh, in, in the modern world and also um, a new type of labor, a, a new type of very routine uh, mechanized labor for the workers. Um, so obviously these big business people are among those who really are embracing the innovations of modernity. At one point Ford said, quote, machinery is the new messiah. End quote. In other words, machinity, machinery is like a god um, during this period. And Calvin Coolidge uh, made a similar comment when he said, quote, the man who builds a factory builds a temple. End quote. It's almost as if big business has become a religion uh, in the 1920s. Now, um, it should be said that uh, Ford's workers were pretty well treated. Um, at first Ford, after he introduced the assembly line, had a very hard time attracting workers. A lot of people didn't want to work according to this new, very routine fashion, doing the same thing over and over again all day. Um, and so in order to entice workers, Ford more than doubled the wages at his plant in one stroke in 1914 to the enormous sum for that time of five dollars um, Per day. And he also created a corporate town uh, where workers could live. Um, this is an example of what we call welfare capitalism, uh, as I mentioned in uh, an earlier lecture. Uh, Henry Ford uh, was a fascinating character. Uh, Ford really believed the Model T was the perfect car and that nobody would ever be able to improve on the Model T. And so actually the Model T was the only car that Ford made from 1914 to 1927. Um, however, there were other car companies competing with Ford. One of them, General Motors, had uh, pioneered the practice of coming out with new models of cars every year, uh, as we're familiar with. So the idea was that you would essentially trade up every year because you would want all the new bells and whistles on the new model of car. Ford scoffed at this at first. He thought it was a way to rip off the public. Um, this practice, by the way, is called planned obsolescence. It's the idea that products are going to become obsolete after a while, and so you have to trade up and get the newest version of the product. We see this nowadays with phones um, too, um, that if you don't have the very latest model of the iPhone, you're going to be left behind. Um, planned obsolescence. 
Well, Ford resisted this for as long as he could, but finally in 1927, um, he realized he was losing market share and he really had to make a change. So in 1927, uh, Ford finally came out with its, uh, a new model called um, the Model A that had a lot more options um, than the Model T. And so ever since then, car companies have come out with new models uh, year after year. Just want to mention that um, Ford's uh, machinery, the assembly line, and so forth horrified some people, but it inspired other people. There were uh, artists, even, who embraced uh, what they saw as the beauty of this new industrial uh, culture, this industrial machinery. One of them was the photographer Charles Sheeler, um, who took these uh, pictures of the new plant that Ford built on the River Rouge. Um, in 1927 to make uh, the Model A. So you see here, in a sense, the power of the Industrial Age and uh, artists even uh, coming to embrace the really impressive grandeur of some of these, uh, some of these industrial structures. Shifting gears, I want to talk a little about two very famous uh, cultural icons during the 1920s. Uh, one of them, Charles Lindbergh, actually lived in southwest Georgia for a while. He was an aviator, and he took his first airplane flight in, um, in, in Georgia. Uh, later, uh, moved to St. Louis and uh, flew airmail runs but then decided to do something nobody had ever done before, namely fly across the Atlantic Ocean a solo and non-stop. And so he named his plane uh, the Spirit of St. Louis, and he took off and successfully landed in France on May 21st, 1927, and instantly became a huge international um, celebrity. And well, he'll come back into the story later because he became a political leader and a leader of the, the isolationist movement uh, before World War II. So we'll, we'll come back to Lindbergh later in the course. Um, the greatest sports hero of the period was uh, Babe Ruth, the uh, slugger for the New York Yankees. And uh, this was a period of time where, you know, hitting eight or 10 or 15 home runs in a year was uh, an excellent total. But uh, Babe Ruth really revolutionized baseball uh, with his home run uh, production, hitting 714 home runs um, during his um, career. In 1927, uh, Babe Ruth hit uh, 60 home runs for uh, the New York Yankees there in Yankee Stadium, which became known as the house that Ruth built. Uh, and that record stood for many years until Roger Maris hit 61 in uh, the early 1960s. But um, it's interesting that Ruth uh, was playing at a time when uh, baseball teams only played 154 games, and Maris, by Maris's time, there were 162 games. Later, of course, sluggers like um, Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, and especially Barry Bonds shattered Babe Ruth's um, record, but uh, it later has been suspected that they were all under the influence of steroids. So you could say that uh, Babe Ruth still holds the, uh, the all-time record for home runs in a 154-game non-drug-enhanced uh, season. Well, um, Prohibition was un increasingly unpopular with uh, many Americans, and there was one politician, uh, the New York Governor Al Smith, who dared to come out uh, and run for president in 1928 with the promise that he would end prohibition uh, if he were uh, elected. Smith's main political liability, however, was that he was um, a Roman Catholic. And up to this point in time, no Catholic had ever been elected uh, president. Smith was the first man to run on a major party ticket as a Catholic. And that made him very unpopular uh, especially in the South, where Prohibition was more popular and where uh, Protestants in this period tended to be anti-Catholic. Uh, and so in the 1928 
uh, presidential election, Smith lost in a landslide uh, to Republican uh, Herbert Hoover. Um, however, the prohibition experiment increasingly um, began to wreak havoc on the country. It was a very noble idea, in a sense. Uh, temperance activists wanted to uh, strengthen the family uh, by eliminating drunkenness. Um, but really, the result of prohibition was to turn many ordinary Americans uh, who just liked a glass of wine or a beer uh, with their dinner uh, into criminals. And uh, it also led to the rise of the mob. It was really during the 1920s, because of prohibition, that modern organized crime was created as uh, criminal gangs in many cities um, took over uh, the distribution of alcohol. Uh, in Chicago, uh, you have the famous gangster Al Capone, uh, who really becomes uh, a national legend uh, during this period. Um, it was Capone, uh, most historians believe, who ordered the famous 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre uh, that you see um, depicted here. And Capone was so powerful in Chicago that nobody was willing to testify against him, and so he was able to um, continue his crime career uh, unopposed until finally uh, he was arrested, convicted, and put in jail on the charge of income tax evasion. <laughs> but uh, really, um, the emergence of mob bosses uh, as we know them today happens because of prohibition. Well, uh, the Roaring Twenties really came crashing to a screeching halt in 1929 with the beginning of the Great Depression. Uh, how did that come about? Well, like I said, the economy was booming um, at the beginning of the 1920s, um, and people began to take out uh, loans so that they can buy the new household products uh, like um, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, also uh, cars. Um, so uh, people are really going into debt so that they can enjoy this new um, technology. And that encourages U.S. corporations to really overproduce um, these products, to produce more products than the market can really absorb. Um, and that became evident uh, later in the 1920s, especially after Congress passed high tariffs, um, which led to a tariff war with uh, foreign countries in which they retaliated by imposing their own tariffs, putting taxes on imported American goods, which really reduced sales of American products overseas. And so you start to see unsold merchandise piling up um, in American factories. But, and also, uh, American consumers, as the 1920s go on, uh, have maxed out their credit, and so they too um, begin to buy uh, less and less of these new products. However, the stock market continued um, uh, to boom. And because people believed that the period of prosperity would, um, would never end, and they simply ignored the evidence that the corporate sector was becoming uh, weaker and weaker. So that you can say during this period, stocks are valued much higher than they really, um, than they really should be based on the actual health of uh, the corporations. And so the prices of stocks continue to rise and rise and rise in an ever-expanding bubble that's partly fueled by the fact that um, instead of plowing their profits into research and development, corporations too are investing in, in, in the stock market and driving those stock market, uh, those stock prices higher and higher. Well, the bubble had to burst eventually. And the process uh, through which that happened started on October the 24th, 1929, when suddenly the prices of stocks began to go down dramatically. Um, on Tuesday, October 29th, panic, full-fledged panic hit uh, 
um, Wall Street and there was a, a tremendous amount of trading on that day as people uh, desperately tried to unload their stocks before they lost any more value. 16 million shares traded uh, on Black Tuesday and there are many stories from the period of um, people jumping out of windows because they've just lost their life savings um, in the stock market and so forth. So um, this is the stock market crash of 1929 that leads um, directly uh, to the Great Depression um, that we'll talk about more in the next module.